<laughs> okay, awesome. All right, so welcome everyone to today's program. Thank you for joining in. So this is LPI's Summer 2022 Intern Stories Program. So every summer, college students from around the world join scientists here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas, and they work with scientists at this institution and at NASA's Johnson Space Center on exciting planetary science research. So this helps these young scientists gain research experience, develop professional skills, and begin to develop networks with experts in the field. So we've put together this program so that people from the community can hear about these internship experiences. What is it like to be an intern on a summer project like this? What is it like to uh, work on planetary science active research? Um, and how did they find out about this program and get involved? So we're gonna be taking questions from the audience. Um, that's gonna be a lot of what we are uh, using to ask questions of our panelists. So if you have a question for them, please put it either into the chat or into the Q&A. So you can find those options down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, this is a Zoom webinar. So you're not gonna be able to unmute or come on camera. So the only way you can ask those questions is through chat and through Zoom. And we wanna let you know that if you have any trouble with the Zoom app, you can head over to YouTube where it's being live streamed. And additionally, we have a resource packet that's gonna be shared out and the link is right here. So later, this uh, video is being recorded. If you lose track of the link, you can watch the recording and get it from this screen. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for right now. And we're gonna start off with a couple of poll questions. So I'm gonna launch the first one. So for our participants in the audience, we have two questions here. If you're joining on Zoom app, you'll be able to see these poll questions. If you're on the browser, or if you're on YouTube, you won't be able to see the polls. Sorry, just bear with us. The first question is asking, what is your academic level? We wanna know, are you in middle school, high school, or an undergraduate college student? Or maybe you're not in school, but you're here because you're a parent or a caregiver, an educator or administrator, and you wanna learn about internships. And then the second question is, just getting onto the topic of planetary science, if you could do one of these things, which one would you pick, just for fun? Fly a drone over methane lakes, drop a, a sensor through toxic clouds, visit ice on the moon, smash a spacecraft into an asteroid, or maybe something else. And if you have something else in mind, please put it in the chat. And I'm gonna give participants about five more seconds. And three, two, one. And we can share the results. So we have a good number of high schoolers, undergraduates and parents. We also have some other folks joining. That's great, thanks for being here. And Okay, so answers are all over the place for the missions. Um, and I just wanna let you all know in case you're not aware, the first four options, these are all real missions. So these are things that are happening or will be happening soon. Um, the first one is the Dragonfly mission. The second one is the Da Vinci mission. The third one is the Artemis program. And the fourth one is the DART mission, which will actually be making impact with its asteroid in September of this year. So there's some cool stuff happening. All right, so thanks for participating in the polls. We'll have a couple more throughout the program. So now we're gonna get to our panel. So we have five interns joining us today and I'm gonna let them go around and introduce themselves. They're gonna tell us a little bit about uh, who they are, the kind of research that they're doing and their academic background. So I'm gonna start off with Garrett. Hi, so I'm Garrett and um, I just graduated in May with a degree in physics from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And um, I do some illustration as a hobby. And uh, my project is actually on these features on the moon. 
uh, that we think are um, volcanic in nature. So we're trying to figure out what they, how they formed. Thanks, Garrett. All right, next I'll go to Will. Hello, I'm Will Wallenton. Uh, I'm from Wesleyan University in Connecticut. I'm studying biology and earth and environmental science. And as a hobby, I like to collect rocks. Uh, and my summer project is, uh, how do I explain it? Looking at the uh, way light interacts with uh, sediments from Martian uh, analogs, environments that are pretty similar to those on Mars. Very cool, thank you. All right, next on my screen is Seti. Hi everyone, um, I'm Seti. Um, I'm a geophysics major and an astronomy minor at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I am working on the geology of the Cleopatra crater, which is an impact crater on uh, Maxwell Montes um, on Venus. Thank you, Seti. And next is Emily. Hi, I'm Emily Etheridge. Um, I'm a rising senior at Marietta College in Ohio. Um, I like to, I play lacrosse and I like to go running a lot of the time. Um, and I'm studying entisite chondrites, which are the closest isotopic match to Earth. And we are looking at the thermal evolution of these meteorites. So using different techniques like the scanning electron microscope, the, electro, the, the microprobe um, to kind of see how these evolved over time within their cooling process. Thank you. And finally, for our intern panelists, we have Daniel. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Daniel Bergen. I'm from New Zealand, so I've got a funny accent. Um, I've come here from the University of Otago, which is in New Zealand. Um, I studied geology. I've actually just graduated last year. Um, my project's looking at meteorites, and we're using those to figure out kind of how cores form in um, asteroids, which is a lot of fun, using a lot of cool instruments. Um, yeah, my hobbies are space, obviously, and um, music, and I like hiking. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Um, also joining us, we have Claudia. Will you introduce yourself, Claudia? Thank you, Grace. I'd like to welcome everyone to this um, series. As Grace said, my name is Claudia Bellard, and I'm the Senior Program Coordinator for the LPI and the SUPER program. And I'm sure some of you are going to wonder, what does SUPER stand for? It is the Summer Undergraduate Program for Planetary Research. Back to you, Grace. Thank you, Claudia. So she is our resident expert about all things to do with the organization of LPI's internship program. So if you have questions, you can ask them here. Um, and then also joining us is Christine. Do you want to say hi, Christine? Hi, Christine. Hi, everybody. My name is Christine Schupla. I'm at the Lunar and Planetary Institute as well, and uh, delighted to be helping with this program. Awesome. And I'm Grace Bodwin, um, also here at the LPI in the Science Engagement Department. So now let's get into the program. I, I want to start off with just kind of getting uh, your backgrounds, our panelists' interns' backgrounds, about how they first got involved in research. So having some kind of research experience, if you're interested in going into planetary science, mission science, um, interested in graduate school, getting a little bit of research experience as an undergraduate or even a high schooler is a really, really great experience to have. But you might have questions about how do you how do you get that? That's not part of coursework. That's something you have to pursue through some other means. So to start off, um, one of our panelists, Will, has actually worked on a bunch of different research projects. So Will, would you tell us about how you first got started and some of the projects that you've worked on? Yeah, so my college experience, or during college, I've worked in I think I, I just recounted it was five different research labs, uh, almost a new one every semester. Uh, so it started off freshman year, getting used to everything. And everyone's emphasizing, you got to do research, got to do research. And so I reached out to the first professor I met and joined their lab doing sedimentology in Antarctica. And that was really cool, but it was also right when the pandemic hit. So I wasn't able to continue that research. 
And I also realized that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. And so then the next semester, I jumped over to a caterpillar lab. And uh, I had raised monarch caterpillars in high school as a little side hobby. And so I thought that would be really cool. But then I realized that <laughs> I wanted to study space. And so then after that, I joined uh, the lab of one of our planetary geologists. And that summer, I worked on uh, remote sensing of plants on Earth. That was uh, exciting. It was cool, but most of her uh, most of her work was higher level. And as an undergraduate, uh, there's sort of a limit to what you can research and what you can't research. Uh, and so unfortunately, I wasn't able to stay in her lab for the next semester, but she said I could always come back. And so then after that, I was in a microbiology lab. And I think I finally found my place in the microbiology lab. And now I'm working on tying that into planetary science through a field known as astrobiology. And so that's basically what I'm studying now. Thank you. So following the question that, oh, what was that? It was definitely a journey, sorry. You, I think that's fantastic. And what I want to emphasize about that is that these are not interrelated, right? You went sedimentology to caterpillars to remote sensing. There's no wrong way to get involved in science. Um, and to build skills for research. They're, you're going to build a tool set that is going to be beneficial no matter where you go with it, right? So now I'm just going to kind of open up this question to all our panelists. Will, when you said you got into these labs, you sort of just said, well, the first one you reached out to a professor that you had met. But then after that, you said, well, then I joined this one, then I joined this one. What does that actually look like? Does someone want to jump in and tell me, like, when you got started in a research project, what did you actually do to form that connection and make that happen? Um, I'm happy to answer this question. I think I think what I didn't realize in my early days of undergraduate studies was how powerful emails are and emailing a professor. Um, and I think what I've always been told with I managed to get into some research on Martian meteorites last year in New Zealand. And, and it's just uh, emailing professors showing that you're passionate about something they're also passionate about. And they're they, they really keen to help out, like get you into that field. Yeah. So I would, I would advise people to email people. And, and I mean, the worst that could happen is you don't get a reply. But the best case scenario is you get a cool spot studying cool stuff. Yeah. So Daniel, when you sent an email, do you remember what was in it? I mean, did you have like, here are all the skills that I already have and the experience I have, like, or were you sort of like, I'm just, I think this is cool. Can I get involved? Like, how, what did that look like? It was definitely more the second option there because <laughs> I didn't have many skills in undergraduate. Um, but then like um, moving through, I, I sent an email saying, hey, I'm really interested in this area of research and meteorites and space, and I want to get involved. And I see that my interests align with your interests. Like, what what do you have on offer? And that, yeah, I don't think you have to, I mean, if you've got those skills, I think it's really good to demonstrate that in an email. But if you don't, still send the email, you know? Yeah. Thank you. I think that's super important. It's really easy to gatekeep yourself and say, well, I looked at their paper and I looked at the methods section, what, what the scientist is actually doing. And it all went right over my, I don't know, if, I don't even know what that means, much less how to do it. So I, I could never work with them. Yeah, Everyone has to start somewhere and they don't teach these skills right in high school or even undergrad. So you got to start somewhere. Seti? Yeah, I just want to piggyback off of what Daniel said um, about even if you don't have the skills, just kind of go into it. Because for my first research um, opportunity, I was very like intimidated um, because I didn't think that I really knew anything. Um, but then that was actually where I learned how to use ArcGIS, which is like a key skill in whatever I'm doing this summer. And so um, I just think it's like a learning process. So don't be like too afraid if you don't know because you're always gonna have someone who is gonna like help you and like teach you along the way. 
Yeah. And I'll say too, like you said, you felt intimidated. Probably something that lots of people struggle with is imposter syndrome. Um, if you feel that and you're comfortable sharing it, will you raise your hand? Okay. Yeah. So I definitely still feel that I felt it in undergrad and then I got to graduate school and I felt it in graduate school. And you, I think at every stage in your career, you'll always feel it. And you'll always think, well, you know, once I know these methods, I won't feel like an imposter, but then there's other ones you don't know. It's never going to go away and that's okay. You're always learning. Um, and there, like Seti said, there are always people along the way who will be able to mentor you. So anybody else, um, did you have a different experience in getting involved in research? Was it basically just a cold call to a professor? What did, what was that like? Um, I know for my experience, um, I, <laughs> this professor, he actually had just put up a flyer about the, uh, the opportunities he had available. And I had been communicating with him earlier this semester because I had just switched from a physics major to a planetary science major and it's a brand new major. Um, and I'm still the only one in it right now. Um, but I just dropped by his office. And I was like, hey, I, I know I haven't done like basically any geology and he's an um, igneous petrologist. So he's only geology. Um, but is there anything I can do to get involved in this? Um, he was like, yeah, all the professors that you're going to talk to are going to be pretty happy to share their interests, and especially if your interests align with them, they'll be very happy to help you out. Um, and going back to imposter syndrome, I know a lot of us have talked to, we were talking about how we all applied, like not even expecting to get this internship. So the worst that you can do is apply to things, and just email people, talk to people. There's no harm in that. So. Absolutely. And another thing for, oh, sorry, Gary, did you want to go? Oh, you're good. Okay. Um, another thing about my experience was, um, so a similar thing um, that happened to Emily kind of happened to me, but I didn't take the opportunity at first. Um, my professor kind of advertised it, but like, it was like my first geology class. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to like stay in this field. Um, and so when he advertised it, I didn't really like put that foot forward because I didn't think that I could do it. And the professor actually ended up reaching out to me. Um, but, you know, it's not going to happen that way all the time. And so I would just say, like, put yourself out there and, you know, just take advantage of everything. I, I kind of had a similar experience. I mean, um, at my community college, uh, we, we just, um, we had small classes and stuff, so I could talk to the teachers really easily. And um, um, one of my professors, who's now like one of my best friends, um, she uh, she she was helping me with the course stuff, and you know we, we were just having fun talking about the stuff because we're both interested in it, you know. And um, um, but anyways, that's how I got introduced to someone here, and he had a little side project he was working on, so um, he was like, "Hey, why don't you?" participate you know so um that's how i got into research so you know there, there's a lot of different ways and it doesn't have to be like you know what you're doing kind of thing, you know yeah that's a really good point and i also i like the point about having just to build connections and it might not be a connection that benefits you years down the road that's okay but you're developing skills um, that you'll use for the rest of your life, interpersonal and communication skills. Even if you work in a lab, like a Caterpillar lab, that you don't end up using in the future. That's okay. Um, so I wanted to ask too about um, working with scientists. So you've said, you know, that you, um, you sometimes had to reach out. Other times, maybe you're at a school that's larger and has more opportunities, and there are predefined programs that you can get into. They're a little bit more structured um, in case you're nervous about just reaching out to a professor. But let's say once you have reached out or you have a position in a lab and you're brand new, what is that like? Um, so let's see, we haven't heard from Will in a little bit and you had several research experiences with several different PIs, PI meaning principal investigator, a scientist on a project. So what 
right? It is probably intimidating to go in not knowing what to do. Can you tell us a little bit, like, were they nice about it? Were they supportive? What does mentorship involve from the perspective of a new student researcher? Yeah, they're definitely very supportive and definitely welcoming of new faces, even if it's for a short while. Uh, I remember one winter I was interning in a bio startup, and I think I spent more time getting ready for the internship than I was actually doing research. Like I had to get in the system, I had to email back and forth, and then send all my information. And then they had to know, like, do you know how to use a pipette? Do you know what a cell is? Like, do you know how to use a microscope? And the process of getting in a different lab or going to a new research experience, they have to establish these baselines all over again, which can be a little frustrating at times, but um, they're definitely willing to go through those uh, efforts for you. I, I've never met a single researcher or professor that hasn't been willing to go above and beyond to, I guess, help me figure out what to do and how to do it. That's a good point. Anyone who's willing to take on a student is doing so because they they like the process and they think it's important. So if you've gotten to the point where you're going to be working with a scientist, I think, yeah, be open, be ready to learn, and they're going to work with you. Does anyone else have another experience they want to add? What, what it was like to work with a, a scientist? If I'm happy. Yeah, sorry, I can jump in. Um, I think the the it's so scary going in at first. Like it's intimidating because you're like you don't know much, and then you're with this person who knows so much about your field. But it's intimidating at first. But once you get into it, you realize that everyone completely understands that you're completely new to this experience, and no one's judging you for it either. Judging for you for not knowing. Like nothing like I yeah going in and having to learn how to use all these instruments and machines it's like yeah you, you don't feel that great about yourself but you realize oh this is actually how you learn how science works and it's actually it's really cool when you kind of realize oh everyone's here to help you out and it's actually not that scary after all but yeah sure it's definitely a bit intimidating at first yeah I'd agree with that um and um, normally, if you're getting hired for something or selected for something, they'll know exactly what you know going into it. So they're not going to expect you to know all these crazy things. So don't be too hard on yourself about it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Just try to be a little bit kinder to yourself um, rather than just beating yourself up about not knowing everything at once, even though you're just like an undergrad student. Great points. Thank you, guys. So I wanna move on a little bit to the process that you guys went through of actually coming across this internship, um, applying, and now you're, you're most of the way through the summer internship, which is crazy, it's gone really fast. So um, Garrett told us that he found out about the internship through a connection between his undergraduate research advisor and one of the scientists here at the LPI. Um, did anyone come across the internship through another route or was it, let me ask, let me just open it up. How did each of you find out about this internship that you applied for and ended up doing? So I'm going to actually, I'll start with Daniel. Um, uh, I actually found out uh, about this internship just through an email that came around um, a bit of a space nerd. So I get you know, the planetary news updates each week. And um, I just saw a little line where it's like applications now open for this internship program and click the link and and then, yeah, the rest all went away. It was great. It was, um, yeah, I actually hadn't heard of this program before that, but that was the process I did. And I got a lot of help from my professor on uh, helping write the application. And uh, I think that's that's a really good thing to do is get help from everyone because, yeah, they, they know what they're doing on this. So it's really good. Yeah. I'm gonna circle back to the actual application process itself, but um, Emily, what about you? How did you find out about this one? Um, yeah, I'd actually been talking to my advisor um, back at school and um, 
he recommended this one and a couple other internships. When I, when I was looking at the websites for them, this one sounded the most interesting to me, um, like with the different um, professional development seminars and um, different activities that we all do. I thought that was a really great opportunity and yeah, just a great way to make a network. So I just applied after that. And yeah. Perfect. Seti, what about you? Um, so I actually applied just by kind of researching like on Google what was out there because, um, you know, it was just like, I think it was my first semester like in person after COVID. Um, so everything was just like now picking back up. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of like research going on um, at my university at the time. And so I just thought like a summer thing um, could be cool and a, just a good way to um, gain some experience in the field. And so I just kind of went online just to see what was out there. And then I found this one and I just applied. And then, yeah, here I am. <laughs> awesome. And Will, what about yourself? Yeah, my story is actually pretty similar. Uh, the semester after we got back from all the COVID business, uh, I just Googled best internships for astrobiology college undergraduates. And so there's a bunch of REUs. There was uh, an internship offered by SETI, uh, S-E-T-I, not SETI Bogart. <laughs> um, and then there was supper. And I applied for a lot of them that summer and ended up deciding to do research at my home institution. But then the research I was working with said, you know what, you'd really like this internship at LPI. And so then I followed through with that the next summer, uh, right now. Fantastic. So, and you had actually applied for this research internship before, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was after my sophomore year and I wasn't as prepared as I was now. And so I'm pretty sure that's why I got rejected. But then I decided to try again and yeah, here I am. That's, that's fantastic. So, I mean, not getting rejected, that's not fantastic, but that you didn't let it deter you. You didn't say, well, I guess I can't ever do that program. Here you are. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And it, it's gonna vary from year to year and advisor to advisor. So in this um, research internship, how does it work for you guys? Like, do you apply and you all do the same thing? We already kind of hinted at this. You're doing different projects, but how does the application process work? Are you applying for the whole program to work on specific projects with specific people? Um, Garrett, will you tell us a little bit about how it was for you? Sure. So um, basically it was just um, a short little essay stuff and um you know and talking about myself my background and experience etc and then um it also asked generally what subjects i might be interested in um i think there was something about like a lunar volcanism another thing was a uh, radar and uh you know there, there's there's a lot of stuff that was listed so i just chose a few that i might be interested in and then um after that, I just got the reference letters from um, two of my professors. And then um, I, I actually was gonna get another one from another professor, but um, he didn't have enough time. So I actually wound up going through my um, my supervisor for my um, uh, part-time job. So uh, she gave me one and then, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Awesome. So yeah, you didn't have to like write a paper about lunar geology, right? Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you don't have to be a pro about this coming in, didn't have to already do a bunch of research and know uh -huh. I want to do this project and I have these skills for it. You're, yeah. yeah, okay. So you're coming in as like, here's me. Do you want the things I mm -hmm. already have? That's great. Okay. Did remember anything different about the application process or want to tell us who you got your reference letters from if you remember <laughs> it doesn't have to be specifically who but oh emily yeah oh yeah um i know that i got my letter of reference from my advisor my uh, the 
department head for the physics department and then also my coach just like people that can show like a wide range of like um your interests and um just your character in general it doesn't need to be all academic people yeah sometimes it's just um yeah that's a really good point and oh i'm sorry i had a little right. wi-fi but go ahead garrett <laughs> um sometimes it's just like uh showing that uh you you put in work effort you know and you know stuff like that too the soft skills are also important yeah that's hugely important soft skills so things like writing reading communication um let me kind of ask you guys in research just across the board across your research projects what are the kinds of skills that you find yourself using most often anybody want to volunteer Go ahead, Daniel. Um, for me, it's uh, definitely writing for me. And luckily, undergrad prepared me really well for that. Um, writing essays and all of that, that was really good. And if you can really kind of, particularly in your later years, um, get like a, how to properly write in an academic way, that's, that's such a good skill to have and that's helped me out so much here and in, in my last research experience because yeah it's a real lifesaver so I think for me it was it's mostly um problem solving just in general because um I mean that that's mainly what the physics degree is about I mean there's a whole bunch of math if you like math but um <laughs> you know that it, it's mostly about breaking down problems into smaller problems and then trying to figure it out so that that's the skill I use most. Um, I'd also say time management. I know it could be really hard if you're doing a more self-driven project to try to um, know where to focus your time and energy but yeah you start to get a hang of that a little bit more as um, you start to get more research under your belt. Um, I would also add like communication because you're like working with the scientists and stuff. And so you have to, you know, be able to communicate, um, you know, just like what you're working on. If you don't understand anything, um, just like stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's pretty much the same for me. A lot of communication, uh, being able to express what you're doing in meetings. There's a lot of meetings and there's a lot of you feel like you're the least qualified person to talk there and you, you got to communicate you got to ask the questions and then reading comprehension there are so many papers that i've had to read and i've got a stack of like four textbooks on my uh desk right now that i've slowly been working through so a lot of reading comp yeah a lot of reading a lot of writing a lot of communicating and i really like the points about time management and problem solving and being able to ask for help. I think that's something that is a skill and you've got to learn it. Um, so on this topic, um, nobody, you know, none of you guys said um, that the skills you use frequently and rely upon are things like advanced computer modeling or calculus, or the, these are skills that you're building and I'm sure you're using, but what about somebody who is interested in planetary science, but maybe they don't have a very strong math or physics background? Um, could anybody speak to that experience? Um, so I would just like emphasize that planetary science is like, it involves a lot of disciplines and there's like so many people around who do so many things. So even if you feel like you're not the strongest at one thing doesn't necessarily mean you can't go into the field at all because you know where you're not the strongest, somebody's gonna help you make up for that. Um, like me, I struggle with like chemistry, for example. Um, but you know that doesn't mean that you know I just sat back and said I can't be a planetary scientist because I, you know, I struggle with chemistry. It just means that you just kind of work on what, on what you struggle with and then just like ask for help because there's always gonna be people who can help you. Yeah. Yeah, for uh, me, math has always been my greatest struggle. 
Um, I remember first year of freshman, yeah, first semester uh, sophomore, no, first semester of freshman year, uh, I took a calculus class, which I'd already taken in high school, and I did not do very well, and I did not practice good time management, and I only started challenging myself during the last month when the exams were coming up, and that did not work out well for me. And I, after that, I sort of told myself that I'm not a math person. Um, but then an astrophysics course came along, which is math heavy, but it's fun math. It's cool math. It's calculating the mass of a black hole or like the when a star is going to die and finding a fun application for something I struggled with really helped me out, but I'm still not good at math. <laughs> I had a similar experience with math. Um, all throughout high school, it'd be like C's and D's and stuff. And then, um, well, now I have an associate's in mathematics and a bachelor's in physics. So I, um, I, I turned that around just because I actually found something interesting to use it for, you know. And um, I'm, I'm honestly surprised there's, there's not a lot of math that I'm doing right now. Um, there's there's statistics, which I still struggle with, but um, there's honestly, it's more like a, using certain programs and stuff, which you can learn by watching videos or your, your uh, advisor will help. So there's a lot of, um, and there's, there's a lot of help out there. You don't have to just know everything. I actually have a funny story about this. Um, my advisor back at school, he, hated math and he didn't take a single math course in undergrad um, and then he just had to struggle through calc one and two in graduate school and he that was the last math he ever wanted to do so you can you can still be like a very successful planetary scientist without um, going all the way through like differential equations or linear algebra you don't need to go super crazy if you don't enjoy the math And uh, yeah, I'd just add that like pretty much any field of science you can relate back to space science and still get into planetary science. Like I started university doing astrophysics and I dropped it by the end of the first semester because I had nearly failed every physics and maths paper. But, and I was really sad because like, oh no, can't do space science. But I took geology and by the time I got to my third year, I was like, oh my God, this is a big part of planetary science and you don't have to be doing some super maths or physics heavy field, you can really tie anything into planetary science. So yeah, it's a really cool field to be in. That is such a great point. Will, did you have something to add? Yeah, I was going to go off of what Garrett said about videos. Uh, YouTube is a great source if you know how to use it. Uh, it's very easy to go down a rabbit hole and um, get misinformed. But there's also great resources like uh, MIT has open courses. Uh, I think LPI puts a lot of their uh, seminars and lectures online. I've watched a couple of those before coming. So yeah, you can do self-education if you use the right resources. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot that you can learn on your own uh, to inform what you're interested in. And I just want to emphasize the points that our panel made that planetary science is incredibly multidisciplinary. So you can get into it from just about any avenue. And once you're in it, if you continue to struggle or really just not enjoy certain aspects of the work, that's okay. There are other people in the field who practice those as their main focus of interest. And that's what science is. It's collaborative and where you have a weakness, someone else has got a strength and you know, you say, here's my data. Will you please do the statistic evaluation of it? <laughs> say, sure. So that's something that our, our panelists, our interns are already learning. Um, and we've got a couple poll questions we're going to launch right now to get an idea of what you guys in the audience, um, what brought you here today and what are the things that you might be struggling with right now? So if you'll take a minute and participate, there's two questions. The first is asking your top reason for coming to today's seminar. This isn't everything that could bring you here today, but maybe you wanna learn about opportunities for internships. 
how to apply. Maybe you want to learn specifically about LPI's internship. Maybe you want to learn about getting started on a research project in general, what to do in college if you're interested in planetary science or something else. And then if you're looking for research experiences, what are the obstacles that you are currently facing? So maybe, and you can click more than one for this one. Maybe you don't feel qualified. Maybe you've applied, but you haven't gotten accepted. Maybe you don't know where to find opportunities or you're nervous about working with a scientist. Maybe you can't afford to do an internship or you're worried about committing to something that you won't end up sticking with. Or maybe there's something else. And if you've clicked other for either of these, no pressure, but you're welcome to tell us more about it in the chat. So I'm going to, we've got about 50% participation. I'm going to wait a little bit longer, about 10 more seconds. All right, and I'm going to close the poll in three, two, and one. Okay, and we can look at the results together. So mostly people wanted to find out about this specific internship. So that's great. And we can answer questions that are more specific about it. And if you have some of those on your mind, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and then just learning more about how to apply and how to find out about internships. And then what we're struggling with, so people not feeling qualified. And I hope that this discussion we've already have, already have had, helps you to realize that kind of nobody ever feels qualified and you just, you just go for it. Um, and if that means that you apply multiple times or to multiple positions, that might be part of what you do. And we're gonna address um, some of not knowing where to find internships. And we can talk about uh, how a lot of internships are funded, meaning that you as an intern would be paid to participate and have a lot of your costs covered. And then finally, this other one, I'm worried about committing to something. Well, a good thing is that you can always change your interests. And um, any scientist who's willing to work with students understands that you might only be there for one semester and that then your interests could change and that's okay. And you won't ever waste time by participating in a research project. You're always building skills and experience and learning what you don't wanna do is just as valuable as learning what you do want to do. Okay, so before we get back to questions for the panel, and again, please enter those questions. I've got one uh, quick slide I'm gonna share. And this is about the resource document that we're gonna be sharing out with you. It's been shared once in the chat, I'll share it again. But inside of the resource packet, you'll see the first page is, um, this was developed for a different one of LPI's program called the Road to Mission Science. So you can ignore the first page, but starting on the second page is a list of internships and fellowships. And there's like 15 pages of them. And so you can go through and see which of these might be of interest to you if they are for the right, you're, you're the right academic level to apply. And then toward the back, there's also information about scholarships and grants. And at the very end, there's other ways to get involved, like joining different networks or signing up for different newsletters. So just to give you a quick overview of how you read this, each one of these items, the title is the name of the program. The top left here is, is UCAR. That is the institution that manages the program. The top right tells you the discipline of the program, but not necessarily the discipline of people who should apply. So like you would be doing data science in this first one, but you don't have to have a data science background. And then there's a description of the program. The bottom left tells you who this program is open to. The bottom right gives you a general idea of when the deadline is to apply, and then there's a link to learn more. So there's tons of these. Items in gray mean that it's a database. So you'll go, you'll click on it, and then it's a searchable database where you would type in, um, in this case, this is for postdoc, but there's NASA internships. And it's a database, and you can put in your academic level, um, your location, if that matters, and then you can search. 
So that's the resource packet. If you are struggling to find opportunities, you should check out the resource packet. The opportunities are not going to be open to everyone, so you'll need to go read about them. Uh, for instance, some are limited just to U.S. citizens. Some are funded and others aren't. But there are a lot of different opportunities to get involved for high schoolers and for undergraduates that are listed in that document. Okay. So we're going to get back to the panel now. And we've got about 10 minutes left in our program. So if we have any questions from the audience, and there's some stuff in the chat, so I'm going to look real quick. So um, a little bit earlier up, uh, Celine said, I feel like I need more skills, but I'm not sure what skills to focus on exactly. Um, so Celine, if you want to provide us with a little bit more information about what area you're interested in, you know, geochemistry, biology, physics, we could maybe give you some ideas of the kinds of skills that, say, our panelists use in their intern program. But more generally, skills that everyone should have are things that we already talked about, the soft skills, the reading, the writing, time management, communication. Those are really big ones, and they shouldn't be undervalued. You can get a long way with just those skills, and you'll always develop the more technical ones. Um, but while I'm wondering we're on the subject, how many... I'm sorry, yeah. Grace. I was wondering how many of our interns um, came in with programming skills already mm -hmm. before they started. See, several shaking their heads no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's good to know. Yeah, well, so let me just kind of ask. This might be a little bit technical, but that's okay. I'm going to go around to each one of you. Okay, so Celine says, I'm a mechanical engineering major, and I know some catting and a bit of MATLAB and Python, but wondering if you need to know a different skill instead. I, it sounds like you've already got some great specific skill sets and you could continue to develop those. Um, to give you an idea, maybe I could go around and ask each of our panelists in what you're working on, maybe what is the program or what is the the more technical skill that you have found yourself using most frequently um, or has been most beneficial to already know in your current project. Does, uh, let's see, Seti, do you wanna start us off? Sure, um, so I'm working mainly with um, ArcGIS, which is like a mapping software. Um, and then I didn't know everything about it. I learned a bit of it from my first research um, experience um, and then a lot of what I know about it now, I learned when I came here as well. And so, yeah, I wasn't like an expert, but just having like a little, you know, background um, using whatever you might want to use um, could be helpful. Um, but other than that, um, there's a lot of learning to do. Will, what about you? Yeah, so I basically had to learn how to do remote sensing um, in this position that I'm in right now. I didn't have that much experience in it before, so I had to learn how to use a new program, a, a new device, and that was just for the remote sensing bit. Um, my next project uh, is about bioinformatics, and I haven't had a class on that yet, so I have a bioinformatics textbook, and I'm having to get the knowledge about bioinformatics first before I can start using it. So for me, um, all the skills that I needed to have before I came here were just learning or knowing how to read well and um, knowing how to apply the new skills. Emily, what about you? Um, for me, I'm doing a lot of um, looking at samples and analyzing them, um, just their chemistry and the different minerals within them. Um, so I had a lot of experience with the optical microscope before that, which I found to be really helpful. Um, I didn't have as much experience with the reflective aspect of that. I did more thin section work. So um, just getting some experience with that, if you're interested in working with meteorites, it's really helpful. Um, and then uh, we've been using the scanning electron microscope and we're going to be using the microprobe next week. So if you get any chances to work with those, and other than that, I would say, um, 
trying to check out image day and XMAP tools. I had zero experience with either of those before that, but um, they're both free to use. So if you would be interested in using either of those, then I would have to check those out. And did you have previous experience working with either the scanning electron microscope or the microprobe? Um, I'd only used one scanning electron microscope for like maybe an hour. So I didn't have much experience with that. I have had zero experience with the microprobe. So yeah. Yeah. Right. Like you walk into a lab, they're like, so this giant piece of humming equipment that cost a million dollars by the end of the day, you're going to be operating it by yourself. <laughs> but that's, that's how you learn. And, uh, preview of graduate school, that's what they're gonna do there too. You'll be just dropped into the deep end. <laughs> so many new skills to learn. Uh, Daniel, what about you? Uh, yeah, so my work's pretty closely tied with Emily. So yeah, studying meteorites, it's mainly the scanning electron microscope and the microprobe. And I was fortunate enough to have some experience on the scanning electron microscope last year. So I, I'd recommend like, if you're into sample analysis, if you're able to even just ask whoever runs the lab at your university or university that you know of, and if you could just sit in and, and watch them, that, that would that's something you can write down on your application that you've at least got a rough idea of what goes on. And, and that's always super beneficial to demonstrate that, hey, I kind of know what this is and I've used some of the data before. Um, and yeah, it was, yeah, I was lucky to have that experience. Absolutely. And there's always a ton of work that is going on in those analytical labs, chemistry labs, physics labs, where they've got big instruments and they're collecting data from samples. And there's a lot of work that just needs labor. Um, and so even if this, the person who runs the lab, like at your university or local research institution, you don't have to just work with a professor. Those folks, lab managers, researchers, um, staff scientists, they, they can offer you research opportunities, even if, like Daniel said, it's you just kind of getting familiar with the lab, um, prepping samples, um, you know, setting up uh, stages, things like that. Um, and it just gives you some exposure and shows that you can learn new skills. Um, so Garrett, what about you? What do you find yourself using most often? So, um, like said, I'm using um, ArcGIS a lot, and um, but I've also had to use some. Um, they're written in Python, but I don't actually use the Python. So, um, but there, there's some programs where they actually convert the data where it can be used into Arc. Um, so that's been interesting. Um, I've also had to do a little bit of um, Bash on Linux. It's another programming language thing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I also, I saw that you, um, they're doing some MATLAB and, um, my roommate actually is, um, he's another intern here and he's working on Pluto using just MATLAB. So, um, you know, it's, that's pretty cool too. Um, so <laughs> I've also, um, I've also, since I'm using radar, I've used some of my, um, electromagnetism physics stuff, which was a surprise to me to actually use, but it was, it was fun. So. <laughs> like, wait, hang on. I've done this before. <laughs> Thinking back to coursework. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. And I see that uh, Will added um, keeping a detailed notebook. I didn't learn how to do that until maybe my third year of my PhD. And then deeply regretted when I had not been doing it for the first two years. And I was like, oh my God, how did I, well, how, I've got like some little chicken scratch. I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, and Seti said, do not estimate, underestimate the power of Microsoft Excel. And I also wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, probably any scientist can uh, back me up. You're going to spend a lot of time looking at Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got one, uh, I've got one final question for all of our panelists, and it's a fun one. Um, obviously, you're doing research on specific planetary bodies, but don't feel like that limits you. You can think broadly about this. If you could travel to any 
object in the solar system, um, moons, planets, asteroids, whatever, um, which one would it be? Or if you could observe any like astronomical event, not necessarily in the solar system, which would it be? You only can pick one. There's no right or wrong answers. <laughs> Who wants to start? Um, I'll go. Oh, yeah, you can go, Seti. Seti, take us away. Um, if I could visit anything in the solar system, mine probably wouldn't be like a planet or an asteroid. I would go to a wormhole because <laughs> I love those and I love the physics <laughs> and the science of that. And it would be cool to see if, you know, you can actually travel to through space time. <laughs> and so I would do that. <laughs> And you might pop out on an interesting planet. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Emily, do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, I would probably, well, this is kind of a two-parter. I would want to visit Phobos and Deimos. Um, that was what my project last summer uh, was about. And I would want to see if they were actually captured asteroids or if they were formed by an impact like our moon. I think that really, and that kind of ties into this project too, about like um, impacting from planetary bodies and watching them reform or um, if they were just undisturbed. So, yeah. Okay, wait. And for those who aren't familiar, Phobos and Deimos are? Mars's moons. The Ooh, only Mars. other two inner moons. Mars's little like potato shaped moons. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to go to Garrett next. Okay, so I, I would have two spots. Um, one would be a, um, a lava tube underground on the moon. Um, I think that'd be really cool because it's supposed to be like huge. And then um, also, I think I would like to go to Io, you know, because there's, there's a lot of volcanoes erupting there and Jupiter's cool and might smell a little bit like rotten eggs, but oh well. <laughs> Yeah, I think you'd you'd want a, a a gas mask of some sort on Io. <laughs> uh, Daniel, how about you? Um, I think I'd have to go with the moon because then I'd get like the headlines for New Zealander on the moon, and that would be cool. Um, <laughs> I would like that. Um, yeah, but I'd also like to visit Europa, find an alien there or something in the in the water under ice ocean. That would be pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go scuba diving in in an ice ocean. Yeah, that'd be very cool. <laughs> uh, Will, uh, I'm kind of stuck between two worlds on this one. Uh, I'd either like to uh, visit the underwater oceans of Enceladus or Europa, or observe in a different solar system the melting of an icy moon. I read this paper about how uh, Jupiters or hot Jupiters, whatever, that have icy moons as they migrate closer to the sun, the icy moons can melt and create like a entirely new ocean planet. And I would really like to see if that's uh, that theory is true or uh, what kind of planet it would become like. Yeah, that's awesome. I want to I want to see that paper. I've never heard that theory proposed. That's very cool. Let's see after this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Celine said that they would like to visit exoplanets that are similar to Earth. And yeah, and truly see life on other planets. That would be amazing. I want to see the, the Chicxulub impact. The, uh, the one that, you know, said goodbye to the dinosaurs. That was a big one. It would also be really cool to see the impact that created our moon. That'd be awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, so we've reached a supernova. Just saying. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'd want a safe distance from that one, but that would be astoundingly cool. Um, all right. Well, so we've reached the end of our hour. Before we let everybody go, please hang on for one second. We have our final poll questions. Um, we really thank you for your participation in these. It does actually really help us. Um, in figuring out how we can design programs that better help our audiences in the future. So we wanna know what was most useful 
about this seminar for you. Um, if you feel more confident about applying for internships and research opportunities, and if you feel more knowledgeable about doing that. So I'll give you a couple seconds to answer these questions. Um, Christine, could we share the link to the resource packet one more time? Of course, great point. And while we're doing all of this, of course, uh, please join us in thanking all of our uh, interns for participating in this year's LPI intern stories. We're so glad to have you here. All right, so I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you everyone for participating. And yes, as Christine said, Thank you to our wonderful interns for joining us. Um, they have a little bit longer in the program and then they'll be presenting the results of their research, which we're all really excited about. Um, I'm gonna put up our final slide. So just a reminder, this event was recorded and it's available on YouTube if you missed anything. The resource packet has been shared in the chat but the link to it is also available on the screen. And the LPI internship, both the summer internship and the super internship are listed in the resource packet. So if you're confused about where to find information about those, that's one place to start. And we really hope that we see everyone in future programs. Please come back and uh, 